Hello there, my visual politic friends. It is often said that the national sport in Spain, even more than football, is shooting themselves in the foot. Be that as it may, here on Visual Politic, every time we've talked about Spain, the general comment has always been that we are pretty pessimistic about what is currently the 14th largest economy on the planet. But hold on a minute. There is also another side of the story that deserves to be told. Over the last four decades, Spanish society and its economy have undergone an enormous transformation. Since democracy came to Spain in the late 1970s, things have changed a lot. The country has modernized and integrated into the global economy at full speed. Rapido, some could even say. For example, during this time, the employment rate has grown by 15 points, which has meant millions and millions of new jobs. Foreign direct investment into the country, relative to GDP, has multiplied by no less than 27 times, from less than 2% of GDP to almost 54%. Meanwhile, Spain has also become one of the countries in the world with the most investment abroad. For years, Spanish companies have been investing tens and tens of billions of dollars all over the world, particularly, of course, in Latin America. And that's not all. Trade openness, that is the weight of exports and imports over GDP, is at record levels. The ratio of unemployment to capital has doubled and the country has built one of the 10 best land, port and air infrastructure networks in the world. In other words, Spain is a rich and developed country that is highly integrated into global economic flows. But we're not just talking about the economy. Over the last few decades, the education of Spaniards has also improved, both in quantitative and qualitative terms. In fact, although it may seem surprising, according to OECD data, since the 1980, the mastery of basic skills such as reading and mathematics has increased more than any other European country except Finland. What's more, the average life expectancy is now the third highest in the world, behind only Japan and Switzerland. But wait there, that's about the end of that story. The intention of this video is not to be an advertisement of the Spanish brand or anything like that. On this occasion, we want to investigate the main storms brewing that threaten the future of the country. Threats and challenges so significant that Spain must take action as soon as possible unless it wants to suffer an economic tsunami. So, Visual Politic fans, these are, in our opinion, or in the opinion of Visual Politic, the main threats facing Spain and, by extension, the economy and the stability of the European Union itself. And do you know what? All of these threats have one common denominator. The Burden of Age Whether it's due to improvements in healthcare, the Mediterranean diet, the beer or the tapas that Spaniards love so much, the fact is that Spain is the country with the third highest average life expectancy in the world. Which on one hand is a blessing, but on the other hand could become a major burden, especially when you have the second lowest fertility rate of all developed countries. Demographic disaster. The pandemic has aggravated in Spain the problem of a population in which there are fewer and fewer births. And of course, longer life expectancy and fewer children, that leads to an aging population. In fact, with the exception of the microstates, Spain is already in the top 10 countries with the highest average age. We are talking about just over 43 years old. Looked at another way, in Spain, there are 125 people over the age of 65 for every 100 children under the age of 16. But None of that is the worst thing. The worst thing is that the aging of Spanish society is going to accelerate over the next few decades. That means if by the end of the 1990s, people aged 65 and over accounted for 13% of the entire population, today they represent almost 20%. And by 2050, one in three Spaniards will be in that age group. By that time, it is expected that the number of people with working age will have been reduced by almost 4 million people. So that Spain will have barely 1.7 people of working age for every person over 65. If not remedied, this is something that could substantially reduce growth and therefore the country's entire economic prospects. And that is provided that life expectancy does not increase faster than expected thanks to new medical and technological advances. If it does, the numbers will be even worse. But wait a minute, because potential loss of workers, while significant, will be far from the biggest problem.
The biggest problem of all has to do with the enormous bill that having an aging population entails. This is by far the great challenge, the great threat, the great tsunami that Spain may face. And that, as we've already told you, may even spread to the rest of Europe. We are talking about pensions, healthcare, and care services. The Court of Auditors certifies a new record deficit in social security, 53.16 billion euros. The state's spending marks record highs after assuming the deficit of Social Security. The autonomous communities will need 35 billion euros additional until 2030 for social spending. And take note, because these are not paltry amounts. Think about it for one moment. In just a few years, Spain will have, on the one hand, much fewer citizens of working age, and on the other hand, millions and millions of new retirees who will be demanding a lot of public services and benefits. How on earth are the bills going to be paid? What exactly are we talking about? And the most important important question of all, by far, what can be done about it? Or is Spain irretrievably doomed? Check this out. A more and more weighty bill. What generally happens to people when they pass the age of 65 or 67? Most of them are starting to retire. That is, they stop working and start living on their pensions. Well, in Spain, the pension system is eminently public and pay-as-you-go. Today's workers pay for today's pensions with their contributions. Pensions, whose portion of public budgets has not stopped growing to the point that the central state is essentially becoming the payer of pensions. We are already talking about one out of every two and a half euros. A quick side note here, since 2000, the cost of pensions has increased by 160%. And Social Security has gone years without balancing the budget. Between 2017 and 2020 alone, the deficit was more than 80 billion euros. And it's expected that in 2022 alone, it'll exceed 40 billion euros. But as we have said, the challenge ahead is even greater. As we've already seen, the forecast is that by 2050, the working age population will shrink by almost 4 million people, while the number of people over 65 will increase by at least 6 million. All of them will have higher and higher average pensions. So if the math doesn't quite add up today, you can get an idea of the challenge the country faces. Houston, we have a problem, but that is not the end of it. The elderly demand not only pensions, but also health resources and spending on care services. For example, in Spain, there is already a huge network of residential homes, day centers, and home services providing care for more than 1 million elderly people. Even so, the percentage of elderly people with places in residential homes or with home care services is still below European standards, which means that public spending on elderly care in Spain is currently below the EU average. So, one, plus one is two. As there are more and more elderly people, Spain will have to spend more. And if, on top of that, the demand for services begins to approach the levels of other European countries, that will mean more spending more of the time. But when I say more, I am talking about so much more. Then we have health spending. To give you an idea, the average per capita expenditure of people between 65 and 74 years of age is double the total average expenditure. And if we're talking all about people over the age of 75, then the cost triples. So you can start to see how healthcare spending is going to evolve and increase increasingly aging country. Pensions, care services, and healthcare. Forecasts suggest that at least the burden of these three budget items will increase between 7 and 12 points of GDP by 2050. And you know what often happens with official forecasts of public spending. They almost always fall short. We are talking about tens and tens, perhaps hundreds of billions in increased public spending over the next few years. All of this at a time when the working age population is shrinking. So now, you should have a rough idea of the challenge that Spain is facing. But at this point, the question we can ask ourselves is, have they passed the point of no return? Are you saying, Grant, that Spain is irredeemably condemned to crisis and economic and social collapse? Well, yes. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Obviously not. In fact, what we are experiencing could be the moment of opportunity, at least in the search for solutions. So, visual politic fans, let's move on to the big question. What course could Spain take to escape the economic tsunami that threatens it? Check this out. Sailing in stormy waters. Let's not fool ourselves. There are many steps that Spain will have to take if it wants to avoid falling flat on its face under the weight of economic insufficiency. And the first thing to do if you have fewer and fewer people of working age and a much larger population over 65 would be to get workers to retire later. This would reduce pension expenditure while increasing revenue. 
Wait a minute. Retire later? Are we talking about old people working until they keel over? Well, yes again. No, I'm kidding. We're not. No. When the retirement age of 65 was established in Spain back in 1967, things were very different. People reached that age in worse condition. But of course, since then, life expectancy beyond 65 has doubled from 12 to 24 years. Despite this, in today's Spain, the activity rate after the age of 65 is much lower than the average for both the European Union and the OECD. Just by approaching the levels of countries such as Sweden, Switzerland or Denmark, Spain could gain more than 1.5 million people in employment between now and 2050. This alone would compensate for more than 40% of the expected fall in the working age population. And of course, it could be taken even further. The question, the big question is how to do this? Well, in this matter, we have a few examples. Do not think that we are the only ones suffering from this problem. Countries like Sweden, Japan and New Zealand have been working on this issue for years. For example, in Sweden, which has the highest average age exit from the labour market in the whole European Union, they have been working on this almost since the end of the 1990s. Over the last decade, they have made early retirement more difficult. They have modified the pension system, which now requires more years worked, and tax incentives have been introduced, such as tax credits on social contributions of companies that have employees over 65 years of age, and also on the income tax of those same elder workers. But perhaps a good example can be found in what you know is one of visual politics' favourite countries, New Zealand. So, visual politics community, to give you an idea, in this country, 20% of the population over 65 continues to work, compared to only 5% in the case of Spain. And they do it with a higher quality of life and by personal choice. Because in fact, in New Zealand, from the age of 65 onwards, you receive the public pension whether you work or not. Despite this, it is one of the countries in the world where the labour participation of people over 65 years of age is great growing the most. In addition to the advantage of being able to freely combine the full public pension with wages or professional income, there are also other important incentives. One of those has to do with nothing less than the system for retaining workers. 50% of workers and unemployed people over the age of 50 receive vocational training to update and, where necessary, retrain. This is one of the highest levels in the world and is something that allows workers to reach the age of 65 in a better position to remain highly productive. In fact, the government stimulates this training with subsidies and participative financing. They see it as a kind of investment. Better workers will mean more public revenue. And yes, we are talking about very specialised and quality training. No generic courses. There is a very competitive market of public and private training centres. And that is not all. Contractual freedom for the over 65s allows companies and workers to negotiate very flexible working models adapted to each circumstance. At the same time, since the late 1990s, it has been forbidden for companies to discriminate against a worker on the basis of age or to force him or or her to retire. Exactly the opposite of what many collective bargaining agreements do in Spain, where labour bargaining is heavily unionised. But getting more people over 65 to continue working is not the only thing that can be done. Promoting saving systems complementary to the public pension, promoting qualified immigration or trying to take advantage of the so-called silver economy are other possibilities that exist. For example, Spain has a great climate, good beaches and practically everything retirees demand and want. This means that they could move, for example, towards an economy that caters to Spain as a destination for retirees. Why not attract millions of retirees from the rest of Europe and make money out of it? Well, that is precisely what the silver economy is all about. Specialising and turning a challenge into an opportunity. And then of course, there is also an urgent need to increase the labour insertion and the employment rate of the working age population, and particularly of younger workers. This is a key issue that we will talk about in a future video. So, visual politics community, Spain faces great challenges in the future. Challenges and threats that we need to start dealing with as soon as possible. Otherwise, in the coming decades, things might get a little rocky. But having reached this point, it's now over to you. How do you think Spain should deal with the challenges ahead? What other threats do you perceive and will it manage to overcome them? Leave us your answer in the comments below. And if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like it so we know and subscribe to Visual Politic. Take care and I'll see you next time.